because we're in for such a lovely treat this evening. Some of you may have had the wonderful experience of hearing Doris Walker Taylor before. And if you have, you know how powerful her, her story is and her the story of her journey and her journey of survival and getting, we, we are this Women's History Month focusing on getting beyond surviving into thriving. We spend a, a, a little bit too much time just talking about surviving. And I think the, the, the intention is for us to become more than just mere survivors. I think all of you probably know that I'm Dr. Catherine Meeks, the Executive Director of the Center for Racial Healing. And we are always so grateful for your support, for your prayers, your money, your telling people about our programs and showing up for our programs. All of those things matter so much in helping us to continue to do the sacred work that we've been called to do. The center is thriving and we are deeply grateful for everybody's uh, participation because it has not been about any one person or one particular thing. It's been a collective, a community collective with everybody bringing the gifts that they had to bring to the table and, and creating this, this wonderful um, collective of folks that are trying to do our best to make create a planet that's sustainable for human life, which is a huge project. And, and we seem to not be doing too well with, with managing it. And, and uh, we are glad to be trying to do our part. So Doris Walker Taylor uh, has, is a, uh, at the present moment, the senior ambassador and graduate advisor at Thistle Farms, where she, where she had the wonderful opportunity of being rescued from the street by. And then she has taken that opportunity to grow herself into a person who is now an author of a lovely book called Hope is Always Real. And I want to recommend that you get Darcy's book. It is, it is a lovely, inspiring story that you will find to be, that you're glad you read it. And she is also available to be a, a speaker if you have events that you would want to have somebody bring an inspirational message to. And the center is 150,000% invested in helping to support her launch this new part of herself, because that is another thing that we all need to do for each other is to help and support people when as they move along in their journeys and to move, help them go wherever it is they're trying to go. So I don't want to talk anymore except to say that Darcy is going to talk for a bit and then there'll be some time for us to have a conversation together. So if you have questions, the, um, there'll be some time for that, but for her to engage with you in, in around that before we end tonight. So Doris, the floor is yours, or the screen, I should say. Thank you so much, Dr. Meeks. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so, so much for taking time out to come listen to me talk to you tonight, and I'm happy to be here. So I wanted to come. I'm so honored that I've been invited in just to talk to you all tonight. And since this is Women's History Month, I wanted to talk to you about a group of ladies that I am affiliated with and talk to you about my life's journey that has helped me to get to where I am in life right now. So as Dr. Mix mentioned, I'm an author of a book called Hope is Always Real. My name is Doris Walker Taylor. I work for a nonprofit organization in Nashville, Tennessee called Thistle Farms. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or not, but I serve as senior ambassador there. So Thistle Farms is a nonprofit organization that is designed to help women just like myself. And when I say survivors, I'm talking about ladies who are survivors of human trafficking, prostitution, addiction, abuse, the entire gambit. And as sad as it might seem, that was the only thing that I could qualify for in a very long time. You see, at Thistle Farms, we have women who come in that are really tired and really broken from all sorts of situ situations. Uh, when I came into the program, I was 
It had been 26 long, miserable years of addiction that I had been in my addiction and been on the streets. So the difference with my story is that as it started out, I was meeting women who had been sold into human trafficking at a very early age, between the ages of seven and 11 years old. And that was not part of my story. And then there were other ladies who were coming into the program that grew up in homes where addiction was prevalent. And they thought that was an okay way of life because they didn't know any different. There were some women who come into our community because they were touched by a family member or a stranger. And that cycle of molestation started a cycle of trauma in their lives. Some women came in because they were actually touched by someone and molested. And so there was all sorts of horrific stories that came in. Mine was a little bit different because I grew up in a faith-based home, had an absolutely amazing childhood, loved my family, loved the Lord, and everything in my life was peaches and cream. My daddy used to teach me that music is food for the soul. And I used to hear my mom, she would walk around the house doing her housework and she would talk to God like he was her best friend. So that was my life growing up. So how did I land at Thistle Farms really tired and really broken? I was 12 years old and out of the blue, a very troubled family member came into our family home, severely injured my mom and shot my father. Oh. Now, I lived in a little small town north of Nashville, and the town that I grew up in was a little town like, let's say Mayberry, a little town like Mayberry, Andy Griffin, nothing <clears throat> ever went on there. Everybody knew one another. And so when this happened, and I had never been exposed to violence, and I had never truly seen a gun, this thing was horrific. So you know I'm not 12 years old anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but this thing has stayed on me for my entire life. You see, I can remember screaming and running over to my daddy. And just as I got there, he failed, which, re which resulted in my being partially trapped underneath my dying father. Mm. Everything about my life changed. Before that day, I was an A-plus student in school. Loved going to school. After that particular incident, my daddy died. My mom was severely injured. So I was sitting in the classroom, and while the teachers were talking to the other kids, my mind would wander back to that same scene. So my grades began to fall. And before that horrific day, my mom was a homemaker. So she was there in the mornings when I left for school, and she was there in the afternoons. But she became the sole breadwinner. So now I'm coming and going by myself, just me and my brother. So I thought it was a great idea to start hanging out with the cool kids at school. And I found myself having a childhood addiction to marijuana at the age of 13. You see, I didn't realize marijuana was a gateway drug. So I remember the first time I inhaled marijuana, I inhaled it. I held on to it and I blew it out. And I thought I blew out some of the pain. And I blew it out a little more and I smiled. So I thought I had found the answer to my problems. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that that was a gateway drug. And when it stopped doing what I needed it to do, I had to move to something a little harder. So at that point, I landed on the streets of Nashville. And by the time I was an adult, I had a full-blown cocaine addiction that took me from the little town of White House into Nashville. And when I tell you all, when I got to Nashville, Tennessee, and I landed on the streets of Nashville, that's where my entire life changed. Everything that was good and decent had been taken from me through my addiction. So I was no longer singing in the choir and praising God and going to church and being happy at school. I'm now a street walker. And I would walk down the streets of Nashville. And because my daddy taught me that prayer is the most powerful tool that we possess, 
I knew I should pray, but I would be so high and so inebriated, I couldn't form a prayer. So I would walk down the streets of Nashville and I would recite the 23rd Psalm because that I knew. That was something I said every day. So I'm walking down the streets, reciting the 23rd Psalm because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. So I'm saying this continually. And I'm crying out and I'm saying, if you would just please come get me, I promise you I'll dwell in your house forever. So my life is full of going to jail and getting out of jail. And I like to make the analogy of Thistle Farms versus jail. Because when you go to jail, they take your clothes from you. They give you this ugly orange jumpsuit in Tennessee. They give you this ugly orange jumpsuit. They tell you when to eat. They tell you what to eat. And they tell you when to sleep. They talk to you in a manner that makes you feel even worse about yourself. But when I came into Thistle Farms, they told me, Joris, dream and dream big. But you see, I hadn't heard of Thistle Farms yet. So I'm sitting there in jail with my head down and I am so depressed. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? How did I get here? So I looked up and across the room, I thought, is that my friend Regina? You see on the street, I had a friend named Regina and she had just disappeared because our lives did not hold any value on the street. So I thought Regina was dead, but here I am in jail and I got to see Regina. But Regina wasn't there as an inmate as I was. Regina was one of the first five women that started the Thistle Farms program. So she came to jail to bring a word of hope. And I looked at Regina as she was standing there, ladies and gentlemen. She was standing there as she was glowing from the inside out. And I said, is that you, Regina? She said, yes, Doris, guess what? I got my life back. I'm like, how did you do that? She said, I found this program. And I'm like, that's not gonna work for me. I have gone to so many 30-day programs. What is 30 days gonna do for me? I've been addicted the vast majority of my life. She said, no, Doris, this is a long-term program. And I said, you know, Regina, I have gone to halfway houses and they're 90 days, but they charge 125 to 140 a week. Now, I'm clean from drugs in the halfway house, but because of my background, nobody will hire me. So I go right back out and trade myself as though I'm some type of a commodity to pay my rent. And after a while, I just go right back to the old habits because nobody's teaching me how to do better. So I go back to my old habits and I'm back on the street again. She said, Doris, Thistle Farms is a program that's designed for women like us. And it's a two-year program and it's totally free. So when I got out of jail, instead of going back to the streets, I held on to the number that Regina gave me for all my might. And I went back home to White House, Tennessee. Now, this story actually is when I've been in my addiction for, I was on the street for 20 years, in my addiction for 26. So when Regina, I saw Regina at this, in jail, and she gave me this number, and I went back home to White House, I had been on the street for well over 20 years. I had two beautiful children that I'd had on the street. Children was amazingly beautiful. I couldn't raise them, so my mom was. So I go back to White House, Tennessee, and I walked up to my mom's door, and my kids ran out, and they hugged me. They loved me. They loved on their mama. They loved me. It didn't matter to them that I was a crack addict. It didn't matter to my kids that I probably smelled like a bear. They loved their mama. So I go in the house where I grew up as a child and, you know, home was not a safe place for me. If I would go in the room and sit down on the bed and look right over my shoulder, that was the very spot outside where my daddy fell dead. So home was not a good place for me. So I walked in the room and I looked around, hadn't been to home in a very long time. And I saw this beautiful picture on the wall that my mom had hung up there of my daughter. So I climbed up on the bed and got the picture down. I scribbled that number on the back of it, put it back up there. And I thought, now that number is safe because everything I touch turns to dirt. But if I can leave that number in my mom's house, in a praying house, it'll be okay. 
So the next morning I stayed there and I called Regina and I said, Regina, this is Doris. You remember that program you told me about? She said, Doris, we have over 150 women on the waiting list. No matter what you do, don't stop calling me. I promise you, I'm going to get you in. That was my first hope shot. That's the first time I'd had any hope in my life in a couple of decades. So I stayed there a couple of days. She did not call me. So I thought, I'm going back to the street. So when I started out the door, my brother said, Doris, you know what? You are killing our mom. Every time the news come on, they find a woman dead. They find a woman that's severely injured and she doesn't have any identification. Our mom goes into a panic mode. She thinks it's you. Can you just please call our mom and let her know you're doing okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sadly, I didn't care. You see, the drugs had me done what I needed it to do. It had masked the horrific pain. But the drugs had done exactly what I didn't want it to do. It had taken away Doris. And I simply did not care anymore. I go back to the street. And my brother had planted a seed in my spirit. I would be about to open up the car door to a, a stranger's car, not knowing if I was going to get out alive. And something in my spirit would say, call your mom. And this thing stays after me, no matter where I was at. I was in a dirty crack house. My spirit would tell me, call your mom. So to fast forward a little, because I want to make sure you all have time to answer some questions. I want you all to know that finally, I went back home to my mom's house. I did call her. I went to this anniversary because that's what she wanted me to do was come home and go to the anniversary. So I went to the anniversary and I sang and I praised and I done things unlike I had done in a couple of decades. So when I went home, the anniversary, they wanted me to sing this song by Lemmy Battles, Chicago Mass Choir. And the song is called You're Looking at a Miracle. And I'm like, really, y'all? A miracle? I don't look like a miracle. <laughs> I don't feel like a miracle. So for the next two weeks, instead of doing drugs and putting drugs into my body, which is now my temple, for the next two weeks, instead of trading myself as though I'm some type of a commodity, I sat on my mom's bed and I tried to get these words in my spirit. Every time you look at me, you're looking at a miracle. So we had the anniversary. We sang, we praised. I did all the things I come home to do. And the next morning I thought, well, I'm going back to the street. Regina didn't call me. I've been home for two weeks. I'm, I don't have anywhere to go. So usually now when I come home, my mom would send me to the store. Of course, I take part of the money. When I accumulated a few dollars, I call somebody and they rush and come get me. Now my mom... She had a relationship with God. And I heard out there in the kitchen, she would say, good morning, God. My baby's home. And I need you to keep it here this time because if she goes back out there, she's going to die. So my mom had a habit of walking around when she did her housework and she would sing hymn praises. And I remember one of my mom's favorite songs was like, oh, Lord, I want you to hear me. And that was one of her favorite songs she used to love to sing so that particular morning, I got up. My mom was in the kitchen that morning praying harder than I've ever heard anybody pray in my life. And she's calling on God. And she says, I'm calling on you because you said you would never leave me nor forsake me. Keep my baby here. Now, I'm in the bedroom trying to get back to the crack house. And I'm like, come and get me. This is Doris. First person had a flat tire. The next person mm -hmm. I called didn't have enough gas to come get me. And I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> so I started leaving messages. This is Doris. When you get this message, give me a call. So my mom comes around the room and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'll be out there to eat in a minute. So she went back out. But when she walked back out of my room, she was singing and praying. And she was singing so fiercely that you could feel the vibrations on the wall. And she was like, Oh, oh, Lord, I want you to hear me. She was singing and she was calling upon the Lord to help her daughter. I'm in the room trying to get back to the street. So she comes around the room and I'm packing my clothes because I'm sure somebody's going to call me. 
And she said, Doris, what are you doing? And I said, Mama, I'm going back. I came home. I did exactly what you asked me to do. And I'm going back. And she said, Doris, what are you doing? And she wouldn't take no for an answer. And I'm like, somebody come on and call me. I got to get out of here. So I'm thinking like, somebody call. And the phone rang. I'm like, yes. I said, hello, you ready to come get me? It was Regina, <laughs> my friend from Thistle Farms. It was Regina. So I thought I was getting a ride back to the street, but instead Regina called me and I came into the Thistle Farms community on a Monday morning, November the 9th, 2009. And I got my life back. So I was, so I'm now a survivor. I've survived it all. But when I got to Thistle Farms, I realized I didn't want to just be a survivor. I wanted to be able to thrive in life. I wanted to be able to, so I started traveling around the United States, telling my life story, setting a lip balm or a candle to help the women at Thistle Farms. And then I thought, I want to tell my story so that everybody can hear it. So then I became an author. So now I'm not just an employee. I'm an author. I'm a speaker. I have my own website, DorisWalkerTaylor.com. And people hopefully will reach out to me and ask me to come speak to their group. So everything about my life has changed. I'm going for, I'm, I've gone from being devastated to living on the streets and being homeless and selling myself as though I'm some type of a commodity. And then I came into the Thistle Farms program that I will always be grateful for. And I became a survivor. And now I'm on the thriving end. My life is so good. And all the prayers that my mom said back then, I'm so glad prayers don't have an expiration date because they're still working. My mom went home to be with the Lord three months after I got in the program. The women held on to me so tightly. And so the tagline at Thistle Farms is love heals. This organization loved me back to life. And they held on to me so tightly that now I have my life back and I'm moving forward in life. So I invite each and every one of you to go online and look at Thistle Farms. I'm also inviting you all to help me out by purchasing my book and also by inviting me to come and speak for you. I've got my life back. I feel like a prince is in a castle on most days. I've got my life back. I can smile again. So things in my life have gotten so, so much better. I want to make sure I leave enough time for you all to have a Q&A if you want to. So uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Catherine for a little while and see if she wants to get in Q&A going. How's that? Is that okay? Absolutely. I imagine that people would want to ask you questions. Yes. Um, and so I would invite you to just unmute yourselves and, and, um, and and ask a question. I I I I think that might be. I can see everybody. I think pretty well on the screen. So if you uh you might raise a hand, that might help so that people won't talk over each other. But um I think that um you know of course Doris can't tell us her whole story in thirty minutes. But I think you got enough of it to be able to ask questions and make comments or whatever you might like to say. So um, so the, the floor is open for that. Yes, Nancy, and then Janet. So we, you know, we there's this expression that, uh, you know, when bad things happen to good people. And, you know, we, we always wrestle with that and think, you know, we've done the right things and yet these bad things happen. And, and I hear in your story, Doris, and, and, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. You know, in your childhood, you said it was a, a wonderful, you know, amazing childhood. How have you wrestled as an adult uh, over the years with this concept that, you know, things were good, your family was doing the, were doing the right things. And then, you know, this, all of this happened. I think, thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate it. So I think for me, because I'm a believer, like the organization that I'm affiliated with, we're not a religious organization, even though our founder is Becca Steves and she's an Episcopal priest. We choose not to be a religious organization because that opens up the door for everyone who needs healing to come in. But I'm a believer. 
I know who I am and I know whose I am. And I grew up in a faith-based home. So when I think about, but I was doing the right thing and we were living a good life. But, you know, just as you said, good thing, you know, God has no respect of person. And it's like the, the, the range falls on everyone. So it happened and it, and it didn't have to end the way it did. It probably, if I had put into effect all the things my parents taught me and went a different route, I could have chose to go a different route, but my go-to was just a quick fix marijuana. And that was not the answer for me. So like, no, I have a sibling and he chose just to stay at home with my mom and go on with his life. But I just, it was, a bad, it was a bad decision on my part. Your regardless of what happened, it was my decision that I made the wrong decision. Yes. Thank you. Janet. Hey, Doris, how are you? I'm okay. How are you good, doing? Good. I remember seeing you at the women's conference a few years ago here in Atlanta. Yes. Yes. Fabulous. Um, I wanted to ask you, where can we purchase your book? And also, if you, uh, how, how we get in touch with you, if there are, if to do some speaking. I mean, there are women's um, centers in Macon and Warner Robins, Georgia, and they may be able to bring you in to speak to women who have been battered or abused or whatever. So I want to find out a couple of Addresses. Absolutely. So I have, thank you so much. And it's so good to see you, Janet. So I have a website. I've built my own personal website and it's Doris Walker Taylor. Okay. www.doriswalkertaylor.com. And that's my website. And when you go in there, you will see my book and you'll see how to order the book from the website. You'll actually see how to contact me. And it has a little jot form there. So when you fill out your request and information, it goes directly to my personal email. And I'll give my email to Dr. Meek so she can get it to you all as well. But okay. yeah, so you all can email me. You can call me. I'm going to be bold and give you my number. Six, everyone, 615-582-582. 653. Yeah. And go ahead and tell them your email address, Doris. My, well, my email address, my personal email address. So my name is Doris Jean Walker Taylor. That's a lot. My email address is Doris Jean Walker at gmail.com. Doris has two R's. So that's D O R R I S Jean, like a pair of blue jeans, J E A N Walker, like you're walking. W-A-L-K-E-R at gmail.com. So my email is Doris Jean Walker at gmail.com. And that's just all one long word. It's not that's all one up, long right? word, no caps, no anything. When I created my when I was going to Belmont and created my password, I was clueless on how long I created my email. I was clueless on how often I would use it. I wouldn't have, <laughs> I would not have made it that long, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, other other comments, I think questions. Mr. Chuck wanted to ask something, I think, a comment. Did you, Chuck Lane? Well, well, I was gonna say I thought it was fantastic. I my story in some way is like that too. When I was in the Marine Corps overseas in Okinawa, and it was Ed Browning, Reverend Ed Browning, eventually come our presiding bishop too for three terms. But I just wanted to tell you it was very powerful. I mean, my Thank I you. lost my dad at 16, and there was some stories I had to go through. Yes. Back yes. 58. Yes. <laughs> when yeah, Ben and yeah. couldn't cry. I was simply not equipped to go through. No one is equipped to lose a parent at that age, especially in a violent way or anyway, anyway, because you're, we love our parents. So I just wasn't equipped to know what to do. And I happened to choose everything that was incorrect. <laughs> and Sue, was it, did you have your hand up? I did. Um can you do these kinds of presentations via Zoom with a group in Arizona? I absolutely can. Yes, I travel around the United States. If you want me to come out there, send me out there, I'll come to you. Or if you prefer, prefer for me to do it via Zoom, I do it all the time. Yes. Okay. What kind of fees do you charge for that? Not to be too oh. personal. It, it can it varies. Just give me a call. Just reach out to me, please. Did you okay. Well, the, the reason I'm asking is I have recently been trained for a program supported by the Arizona Episcopal Diocese. And it's called the Bridges Reentry uh, Program. And what this program does, it's I think it's based on Thistle Farms. It helps women coming out of the women's prison in Perryville. So when they're released, there is a 
house where they can go for two years to be supported as they're trying to get their feet back on the ground and establish a life outside the prison. Okay. And I have gotten training to be a mentor, a one-on-one -on -one mentor to a woman coming out of prison. Not that I know everything they need to know to come out and get a life established, but just be someone to talk to and be support. I understand. For them. So apparently that is some help. I'm still waiting to be matched up with a mentee, but hopefully that'll happen soon. I'm very excited about it. And then we also, also part of that program, the prison ministry program out of the diocese, there is a worship study that goes, they go into the, the prison and help the women with a, a worship study. Okay. And I guess that's kind of how they so, get signed up with this program. So I'm thinking so if you, that might, you might be a wonderful presenter as we go through our training. If uh, you have, if you feel like you want to uh, engage Doris, please be in touch with her via email or telephone. And let's just continue with asking her questions that relate to her story okay, the, great. for the rest of this time. But I, she would be delighted to, call. Um, to, to engage with you totally. about the details of that. Right. And I, I want us to be supportive of her, but, but you do need to uh, be in touch that way. So other, other people with uh, questions or comments or observations. Yes, Marie. Hi, you mentioned that you had two children. Yes. Yeah. Do you uh, see them? Or I, I don't want to ask a personal question. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. But by this time in my life, there are no personal questions, really. <laughs> yes. Okay. You know what? As a matter of fact, you would not believe how great God is in my life now. So as I sit here in my living room talking to you all now, I live back in White House, Tennessee. My daughter lives in the subdivision, maybe like a half a block from here. So my daughter and her family lives up there. My son lives in Nashville. So I'm a grandmother. I'm a great grandmother. Whew. Oh my gosh. But my, yeah, so my my uh, grandkids think I'm really amazing because they see me on TV. And I've been on 700 Club and they see me on different places. And they're like, oh, look at Grandma Darcy. They think I'm really something special. It didn't happen that way. So, But I'm glad to tell them my story and let them learn from what I've experience rather than try it themselves. So I have an amazing, to answer your question, I have an amazing relationship with both of my children now. And as I sit here in my living room, I'm married now. So I live three doors from where all my trauma happened. I went around the world, fell off the end of the earth. And on the day that my daddy died, my best friend was a little girl named Linda Taylor. And her brother was this little skinny guy named Jay Bird. And Jay Bird, I got a picture of him right up there. I don't, you probably can't see it, but anyway, Jay Bird is her, <laughs> her brother. So his name is James Taylor. And I tell people, not the James Taylor, the singer, but he's my the James Taylor. So I had a big fancy wedding and got married four years ago. So now I live back in White House, Tennessee, and I live right where my trauma began. And I love living here in White House. because It was a very special place to live. So I've got relationships back with all of my family again. Yes. Thank oh, you. I know. I have your... Awesome. This part. I love this. And love is the most <laughs> powerful force for change in the world. And it is. When, when I've ordered from Thistle Farms and I get a handwritten note from somebody. Pro you probably get it from Candice, a girl named Candice Green. Let's see. Yeah. With gratitude, yeah. Valerie. Yeah. Oh, Valerie. Okay. She's one of the girls in manufacturing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love that. That's very a good. very special touch. It is. Thank you. And and I would like to encourage people to shop at Thistle Farms because even every every time I mean to think about these women are self-sufficient. I mean, they're not having to live on worrying about writing um proposals to get funding from somewhere. They are able to take care of themselves because of the business that they run, which is really a wonderful model. Yes, Deborah. It is. It is. 
And I want I wanted to say that Thistle Farms, uh, we keep our doors open through the sales of our products, private donations, and grants. So please shop at thistlefarms.org. If you want to become a donor, please do so. So this is an amazing cause. And we have 95 sister organizations around the country. So if you go on our website and look at our national network and put in the state where you live, you'll see we'll probably find one of our sister organizations near you. So Deborah, go ahead. Hi there, Doris. Thank you so much for this. You're welcome. I'm Thank curious you. more about how the program at Thistle Farms works. Um, what kind of the foundation you say it's not religious, but um, how was it? How did it evolve into a, a program that you know for two years? Okay. The, yes. <laughs> So the program was founded, as I said before, the program was founded by uh, Episcopal priest, Becca Stevens. So she actually went out on the street. She found five women that were either addicted, abused, or trapped in a cycle of human trafficking. She brought them home. And the first Thistle Farms house was in her neighborhood because she didn't want people to think that she would bring women off the street and set them in their neighborhoods. So the women were coming in, they were getting clean, they were getting their lives back, they were going to court, getting their records expunged, but we were dirty poor because we lose everything we own in our addictions. So then Becca Stevens realized that uh, just bringing us in and getting us clean was not making us self-sufficient. So then she started the Justice Enterprise, Thistle Farms in uh, 2001. So uh, Thistle Farms is a two-year program. And here's the thing, we don't have any authority living in the houses. So when I first got there, I'm like, well, who's going to watch me? Because I can do some, at that time in my life, I could have done some crazy stuff. And so I found out that the houses are a beautiful sanctuary. The houses are built lavishly. They're built the way most churches build their organs. So those farms came in as a place for women to come in and heal and rest from all their brokenness. And then we got the social enterprise and we started giving women jobs, making lotions, soaps, candles, and lip balms. And then we ventured out. We have the administrative offices. We have a cafe at Thistle Farms. We train people to be baristas. We train people to be uh, baristas and to be sous chefs. But Thistle Farms now has 26 global Parties around the country where we help women in Rwanda, Africa, San Juan, Consolas, Mexico. So it has evolved to be one of the largest social enterprises of this type. And then it gives us an opportunity as myself to step off and give another woman an opportunity to come to Thistle Farms and I can venture out to try to do more on my own. So that's the spot. That's where I'm at now. Yes. Doris, didn't didn't Becca write about this in one of her books? I'm not remembering which book. She, but. she did. So uh, this uh, Love Heals. So Becca Stevens wrote a yeah. book, it's a beautiful book, and it's called Love Heals. And it yeah, takes yeah. all things Thistle Farm. So if you go online and purchase her book, Becca, just put in Becca Stevens, and she's an amazing author. She has about 12 different books. Practically Divine is her last book, but Love Heals, which is a tagline. If you buy that book, you will have all the answers to anything you want about the farms. Yes. And one of the things that was so impressive to me was that the expectation was that the women would govern themselves, and they yes. did. Yes, we did. Uh, from, from day one. So, it, which goes to show if you invest in believing in people, it's amazing what the response might be. Yes. Yeah, so to... this organization didn't didn't lock me up. They didn't talk about me. They loved me. They loved me until I could love myself. And the reason we didn't have authority because some women had been abused by people in authority. So Becca Stevens has a, a past of her own where she as a little child, she was abused by someone in authority. Uh, but so they didn't want any authority in the houses. So the women live in the houses alone. They're beautiful houses. Each one teach one. But then from eight to four, we have constructive meetings all day. They send us to therapy. They get our teeth fixed. So every it's like it's a therapeutic place to live. So it's a really great place to live. Yes. Yeah. And other other thoughts, other questions or comments? While you're thinking of what you might want to say, I, I think that this model of, of helping is such an amazing one and one that we could learn so much from because we have we have so much toxic charity in this country and in our churches and so much 
uh, so many strings attached, whether we whether we um, whether we verbalize them or not. Sometimes the nonverbal ones are worse than the ones that actually get verbalized, yeah. and people pick up on all of that. And many times people find it difficult to want to be a part of. Like folks will say to me, sometimes they know somebody who'd rather stay outdoors than be in a shelter. Well, they would rather stay outdoors than to be in the kind of shelters they could be in, where there's you are treated as a second, third, fourth class citizen, yes. and people don't want that, you know. So to be someplace where it's clear that somebody thought you worthy of the very best in terms of having a beautiful place and then treating you like a worthy human being had sent such a powerful message to people. And I think we need to think, we all need to think more deeply about what is our attitude toward those who have, who we end up helping, no matter who we are and no matter who they are, because it's easy to fall into that hierarchical trap of I'm better than, I'm better than you because I'm making it and you're not. And and you can just you can have that feeling about somebody and they will know it. Yes. And it will make a huge difference in how the what the relationship is, right, Dars? That's true. I agree 100 percent Yes, that is true. I mean, it, it was like, you know, you don't want to be in a in a situation where you have to think of yourself as us and them. That's that's a bad way to have to try to help somebody when you when they think of it that way. And you know, and it's 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 a matter of when you're around people that you're trying to help that might have had difficult times in the past, it's very good to remember and learn if you don't if you don't know trauma informed care because there are certain words you just don't say to somebody who's already broken. And, and you could say the same thing to the person next to you that you couldn't say to it's just the way you say it so yeah it makes a big it makes a major difference yeah so and I learned while I was on the street that uh addiction does not discriminate there were people on the street who at one point were was lawyers there were people on the streets who were NFL players and they landed on the streets so there's nothing to say that just because I used to live this type of lifestyle that's how I hope it does but that doesn't mean that it's going to continue to be so so yeah, I would be very, I've learned to be very cautious not to just assume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I wonder, do you have do you have dreams or nightmares at all about your past life versus where you are now? So I have, you know, I've got 13 years clean. And I don't, and so when I was getting clean for those two years in the program, I had using dreams. And that goes for anybody. If you're in any, any kind of bad relationship or anything, when you go to bed at night, all the worries come to visit you. So I was having using dreams. And I was thinking I was in the midst of you. And I wake up holding my breath because I thought I was ingesting drugs. I don't have any nightmares in dreams now. But the one thing, it's just like that there, I could be headed to downtown Nashville to go down and, and speak to a group of lawyers or a group of attorneys or whatever it is I'm doing for the day. And I pass by a street and I stop at a light and I'm like, oh, I got raped right there. You know, the, it, something would just hit me like a ton of bricks and the past will come back without saying, this is your past and I'm coming back to tell you something. It just hits you all of a sudden like a ton of bricks. So I experience that all the time, especially in Nashville. Nashville is where I use drugs. So there are a lot of times I can just be merrily on my way and something will reel me back into where I was. So I have that experience quite a bit, yes. And how do you deal with that, Doris? I love my, well, right now I love my therapist. <laughs> you know, when you're at those farms, they give you therapy. They send you to therapy. And because it's a two-year program, you have an opportunity to, when you first get there, I hated my therapist. And then I fell in love with her. And then I hated her again because she was trying to tell me what to do. But I love my therapist. I continue to go to therapy. And I think therapy is a great thing because I just need to tell somebody. You know, in, in addition to, I'm always going to tell God because I'm a believer and he's just magic. He just can do anything. Not magic, but you know, he's just so powerful and so amazing. He can do anything and he can help me through anything. But I still believe in therapy wholeheartedly. So I go to therapy. Yeah. Yes. Well, I believe in therapy too. I think everybody in the country should have a very good therapist. Yeah. And there are some days if I'm in a good spot, I'll pass by and something will joke me and I'll be like, but look at me now. 
<laughs> but look at mm-hmm. me now. So you can't do that to me, past. You can't do that. Look at me now. Mm-hmm. Yes. Good. Oh, I know. Yes. Yeah. It just seems like it just speaks to unconditional love what you embraced or continue to embrace throughout your experience and as well as being accepted into this farm so it strikes me that your faith your mom yeah very big part of that and your dad and your dad very big part how are you doing so yes thank you for saying that about five minutes i'm off i'm almost finished with the zoom call all right, call your back. Mary Jane, could you mute yourself? Were you talking? <laughs> I think it was Miss Sarah, maybe. I'm not sure. Well, is there someone else with a um a comment or a question? Doris, would you have some other words you'd like to? Uh, share with the group as we wind down here. So I wanted to say thank you so much for sitting here and listening to me talk because I love talking. That's part of my job. That's amazing. That's a God-given talent that God lets me speak. And that's what I like to do is talk. So that works out well. But thank you all. And remember, to, you know, go shop at Thistle Farms. Please purchase my book. Hope is always real. And I'm asking each and every one of you just to remember this face and remember my name. And should you need a speaker in any capacity, whether it's in person or Zoom, or, or deal, whatever, you know, I'm happy to do it. So please just keep me in, keep me in mind. And if you want and, me the capacity to represent Thistle Farms, I'm the person. If you want me in the capacity because you're willing to help me move forward in life with my, in my own endeavors, I'm the person. Yes. And, and if you want, if they want, if people want to invite you to sing. And if you want to invite me to sing, I love singing. Yeah, yeah, I, I listen to your your amazing voice, and and I I was thinking, well, we need to do something where we could have you sing, but right. uh, but I didn't want to ask you to sing and speak at the, the same event. So we'll. I remember maybe... when I when I came to Thistle Farms because I loved music, and my daddy taught me music was food for the soul. I wrote this little door. I call it a dorky song. I wrote this song about I'm a thistle farmer, and he names every single product that we have at Thistle Farms. And I made the mistake of singing in front of Becca, so she sent me to her, her husband, Marcus Hummond, is a renowned uh, music writer. So he carried me into the studio and put music to it. So I actually have a song out. It's called I'm a Thistle Farmer. It's not for sale or anything, but it's just something I do, and I travel and I sing it. But my true true calling I do believe is gospel because that's just what I love to sing I sing all mm-hmm. I, you know I sing gospel I sing songs that I write but the gospel is mine I was gonna ask you if you wrote if you wrote songs I have I have wrote many I've written songs when I was on the street I actually had words going through my head and then when I started getting clean I would journal and I actually wrote songs in the back of my journal I think I have a I have a couple of songs in my book that I wrote and a lot of poems and a lot of prayers so my book actually talks about how to find hope in the midst of darkness so my book is called hope is always real and I'm talking about finding your light in your life whether it's addiction whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it be a divorce, whatever goes on in life, because it's sure to happen. We always want to have trials and tribulations. So my book, because I'm a believer, it has Bible verses in it. It tells much more of my story than I've had time to tell here today. And I just ask that you all please just support it and go read the book. And yeah, invite me to come sing. I'd be happy to. Yeah. I think it's also very important. You know, we we listen to someone to tell a story as you have told where the circumstances have been incredibly tragic and many folks have many of us have been blessed not to have to uh abide that level of tragedy but everybody has had to suffer something and i think that it's real important for all of us to understand that we can we can understand each other even though our experiences are different. I think we get caught in that, well, you, that was so different and I don't understand any of it and I it's beyond me to uh, imagine it, but it's not. I mean, it, you know, it's gradation. So suffering is suffering is suffering. Yes, and, is. And, and your suffering was long-term and, and incredibly uh, horrific, but 
suffering is suffering. And I, and I think that the more we understand those kinds of common threads, it helps us to connect to each other and be able to be a better community to each other yeah. instead of being so clear that, that, well, I don't understand that. So that means you're other from me. It means I can't understand it. It's just a little bit different from what I had to go through. And, and I'm so grateful for your, um, your internal fortitude, your, your, your never letting go of hope. Well, you know, you. we, we often talk about Howard Thurman talks about wondering what was it that sustained the slaves during slavery? What was it that could sustain a people who woke up every day with the, with the external reality, not offering them any reason to want to wake up the next day, but they kept on getting up and not only getting up, but creating and being and leaving us a legacy that we all have access to. And so it's that kind of it's that kind of faith and, and internal fortitude that you have been describing for us tonight, I think, yes. that is a part of the answer to that question about the slaves, you know, That's so, true. yeah. And, yeah. you know, that reminds me of how generational curses or how things happen to the our kids because like you know I saw this analogy one time it was about um I didn't realize it but you're like fleas can jump really high a flea can jump like 36 inches two and a half feet they can jump fleas can really jump and they can jump so that's why when you get a flea somewhere it, they end up everywhere but then if you put, <laughs> if you put fleas in a jar and put the lid on it they will continue to jump but they but they they can't go much further. They can only go to the top of the lid. They'll jump. And then they'll mm -hmm. go to the bottom of the jar and they'll breathe and they'll have babies. And then the babies never see their parents jump because they're in that, they're confined. They're confined to that. So the mm -hmm. children they grow up doing just what they saw the parents do, which was jump and hit your head, jump, and you only go so far. But but in the beginning. They can jump. A little tiny flea can just really fly, just really jump. So we have to realize that uh, we are confined by our circumstances only for a little while. But my mm. lid is off. The lid is off for me. And I can mm. jump now. And that's what we get to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I seldom, if ever, do I think I've ever been in a presentation where someone, in everyone in that uh, presentation, in the audience listening to me, if they haven't been, known anything about addiction, they've got a loved one or a family or a member or someone that knows somebody that knows somebody that has. Mm -hmm. been. So it's a, it's just, yeah, a, yeah it's prevalent. It, yeah. it is. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Doris Walker Taylor. We are, we are blessed to know you and blessed to be a part of your journey. And I think everybody who has been present here tonight has been blessed to hear you. And we will do all that we can to support you in every way that we can. I, I think I, I think I can speak for the folks on the screen. And uh, there's a recording of tonight's uh, talk that will be on the YouTube uh, page for the Center for Racial Healing. I would invite you to visit Darcy's website and also the Center for Racial Healing to keep opening the emails, you're already on, you already subscribers. That's why you know about these events, but keep opening the emails and keep spreading the word that, that healing is possible. Healing is possible. And we don't have a choice, but to work for it. If we want to keep on living on this planet. Yes. So thank you so much for your support thank and you. your presence. And we will see you uh, in two weeks. We will be listening to the Reverend Nancy Frostro, who is a, a DACA young woman priest at the uh, in charge of, of Latina studies at the Seminary of the Southwest. And she is a phenomenal human being. And I hope you will plan to come back and, and listen to her. And then the last uh, Monday in this month, we will have Rosita uh, Stan, uh, uh, Hosley talking about her remarkable aunt, Polly Murray, who is actually going to be on the new quarter that's being issued uh, here pretty soon. So uh, please plan to come and hear Rosita. Rosita has been a, a, a very amazing ambassador 
for Polly Murray since since her since since she started writing and talking about her. So please spread the word. Invite your friends and neighbors to join us for these programs. These are amazing stories of women who have overcome great odds to become much better than survivors, but actually showing us the way to thrive. So God bless you and keep you. And, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.